Alex, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I just want to jump right into it. Um, I think what you're doing with Neurosity is absolutely amazing, you and the team. And I want to know what inspired you to delve into neurotechnology and co-found Neurosity. Thank you. Um, well, um, I grew up in a family that there was like depression, uh, epilepsy, uh, things that were mis that misdiagnosed. So I did grow up uh, of like with this idea that the brain was uh, a very sensitive thing, and it was like this black box, and it could it, it did have like it presented opportunities for families to you know suffer and and grow with pains, and mm -hmm. um, that definitely I think had an impact on why I I wanted to dedicate the rest of my life to like understanding the brain and help people understand their brains better and even use neurotechnology to uh, make themselves feel better. 100%. So I guess coming off of that, can you describe to me the core mission and vision for Neurosity as a company? Yeah. If in 10 years from now, maybe 15 if we could have it our way, we would say that we cure mental illness. That's wild. That'd be, well, that'd be great for me as well. Uh, for billions of people, probably. Yeah, it's completely, of course, it's, it's a big statement. It, we will most likely fail, um, but we're going to try. Yeah. Well, it's already exciting. I mean, what you're doing, which really brings me to get, you know, to the crown itself. I mean, to the product, I'd like to know really just more about that in your words, and then we can expand, expand on that. Yeah. So the crown, it is an EEG device that measures your brain activity and is able to quantify high level mental states, like how focused you are, how relaxed you are. And with the software that we have developed, we have figured out a way that not only like passively track your mental state, mm -hmm. uh, but give you a way to shift from one mental state to another mental state. For example, uh, take productivity. You could go from being unfocused and unproductive to being productive. You can go from being stressed to being relaxed. And, and we do that with a feedback loop that uses audio that changes exactly how your brain responds in order to um, stimulates the very frequency in the brain waves that are directly correlated with those mental states. So we call that neuroadaptive audio. And our users are using it to be able to shift into focus, uh, to meditate and, and relax. So we believe that mental health, uh, let's say for an undiagnosed brain, um, the, the, the pyramid or not the pyramid, but like the the foundational stack of of a good mental health in, involves like productivity so you feel that you have purpose um relaxation so you can rest right uh sleep because without sleep you like the other two you know it doesn't matter how well you're doing so you know with those three things we believe someone could be living a much healthier life when it comes to mental health Absolutely. Well, I think I, like a lot of people, discovered the Neurosity Crown via your collaboration with Grimes. And I want to speak to that specifically. Um, first laying eyes on the product, I just thought it was just an amazing, amazingly cool looking piece of technology. And so I became instantly interested, of course. So could you delve into how the collaboration between Neurosity and Grimes came about? And what was that process to create the custom brain computer interface for her. Yeah. Well, Grimes is, she's a visionary, right? And I mean, one of her latest songs is called Wannabe Software. Like it doesn't yeah. get more uh, futuristic and tech than that, right? So yeah. um, I believe she went to visit uh, one of her offices um, in San Francisco. Um, there are many startups working there. I don't know exactly the reason why she was there, but she was there and she stumbled across 
uh, some of our team members. Uh, she ended up trying the crown. Um, I believe she liked it because what I know that happened after that was that she wanted a custom um, crowning white. Keep in mind, we, we've never developed a crown of another color that is not just black, right? No one ever has asked for that. I, you know what? Actually, people have asked for that, but uh, if Grimes asks, you do it, right? So sure. um, I, my co-founder, uh, AJ, uh, worked with other folks. Um, and yeah, they basically, the first version was just basically just like, taking a, a whole production crown apart, spray painting it. And then we took it to the next level after we had a little bit more time and actually got it into our production with the actual, you know, uh, Pantone color that you put into the injection molding that creates the actual end product that is like uh. native, had the native color. Um, and, and we, and we have sent those, of course, um, Given, you know, the relationship between, I believe, you know, Grimes and Elon Musk and Elon Musk having a, having founded a neurotech company, Neuralink, uh, and the association of, you know, like we are a neurotech company. Um, we are non-invasive. Neuralink is invasive. Of course, this was like press and a little bit of drama. Of like the headlines, I think, were, was something like, Grimes uh, gets a custom brain computer interface from Elon Musk competitor Neurosity or whatnot. Um, but you know, um, I, what I really want to focus on is like uh, the actual work that Grimes is doing and the really cool stuff that she has put out there. Um, she took it to the MK Ultra Festival, and there was uh, live brainwaves on stage. Something that takes a lot of courage and an incredible tech team. There was one of the um, one of the very good uh, like engineers that was in the same office as Neurosity that um, they embraced, and he, with his experience with the Crown, has you know helped them accomplish some of that stuff. Of course, with the incredible uh, tech team that Grimes has. So um, I did see a kind of like a preview of one of her music videos that I don't believe has uh, been released yet. And there is quite a bit of white crowns in that video. And uh, it's something that makes me very excited. Obviously, we created the crown with specific visions of like extending human autonomy and mind control, which we accomplished to a good degree, and then our pivot to mental health. But what happens when you create a platform and you offer all the data openly, you have a, an open source SDK and you create uh, great documentation, like people will just take it and build stuff. So we've seen things like people summoning Teslas with the crown. We've seen people playing video games. Uh, we've seen people like just firing a coffee machine to create coffee. Just like people want to. People understand that their thoughts, when they become real without their bodies, it's a completely different experience that it's, it's really unreal to do it. Like the first time I scroll a computer uh, with the crown without using my hands, I was just like, wait, did that just really happen? Was that me? Like, you know, so um, I think people, mostly the developers, artists, creators, uh, they find something like the crown and it just becomes a tool that allows them to express themselves in a completely different way that it wasn't possible, you know, um, some time ago. So uh, it's, it's really refreshing to see all the amazing work that the developer, artist, research and science community have put out for sure. Absolutely. Well, that raises a number of interesting questions. Um, I think the first of which being how you touched on the invasive, invasive versus non-invasive implementation of these devices. And you had mentioned, of course, uh, uh, Neuralink. And Grimes also highlighted this, I believe. And I'd like to know, how do you think this non-invasive approach sets Neurosity apart from the other brain-computer interfaces, which do take a much more invasive approach, which I also think is 
something that people think about when they think about their future relationship with these devices, if they're willing to take that additional step. But I'd like to hear it from you. Yeah, I mean, if you're building a neurotech company, um, regardless of whether it's non-invasive or invasive, you are ready one to give humans pretty much like superpowers. There's no other way of saying it, right? You you want sure. to help people. Like it is much of a, like the what this technology can allow you to do, whether it's non-invasively or invasively, it's like amazing to, you know, to an extent that, you know, you have to try to to really feel it. But there are pros and cons to both, obviously. And um I mean to to not state the obvious um or to state the obvious, uh, a, an invasive company will require uh, to drill a, a hole in your skull. They are more like semi-invasive that uh, it doesn't require that degree of surgery. Nonetheless, uh, some type of surgery that can be very scary to a lot of people. So the, the people who will benefit the most from using an invasive technology are the people that... Um, have much less to lose and 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 that it it would enable them it will transform their lives to a degree that the cost benefit you know allows them to really like want to try it like someone who you know could be like paralyzed uh from the hip down uh someone that is is not able to speak someone that is not they don't have mobility in their arms or hands you know like uh I remember uh, talking to a developer after giving a talk and he was in uh, in a wheelchair, you know, and I, I remember he, he came to me after the talk and said, hey, like I've been dreaming about, you know, using this technology. And 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 I was like, yeah, I mean, this is something that definitely has a potential to allow your you to control your wheelchair like your mind. And what he told me just blew my mind. It's like, how did I think so small? What he told me was, no, I don't want to control my wheelchair. I want to control an exoskeleton. I want to walk, you know? So non-invasive technology will have, will have a huge impact on people who desperately need a way to be autonomous, right? Uh, on the other hand, for... The people who, let's say, have full mobility, you know, um, would they take get a surgery if they needed to basically understand their brain activity and understand like the state of their mental health? Uh, that is yet to be seen, right? Like we, we need to to see that. But could non invasive technology touch a billion lives in the next five years? Right. So we are approaching the problem from the non-invasive side, knowing that it would force us to get creative in the way we image the brain and push our software to be able to deliver the best results without surgery. And that's when Neurocity comes in. You know, like we're the first brain-computer interface that uh, put a, a whole computer on the device. Like there's a 1.8 gigahertz CPU in there enough RAM to run machine learning. It has enough brain system that we can send over the air updates, just like your iPhone, right? Um, and state of the art, you know, uh, encryption um, and security. So um, there's definitely a lot to be done on the non-invasive side that, that hasn't been exhausted at all, you know? Uh, we, we, we have crowns in over 56 countries. There are people that have told us like, I'm, I, I, I cannot get to work without like using the crown for five minutes before I need to do something, right? Um, you know, um, my mental clarity has improved tenfold, you know, like things that are not small, they are like really, they make a hell of a difference in people's life, like today, not, mm -hmm. not in a year, like right now, right? Yeah. So um, I'm very bullish on both industries or both different approaches to you know, non-invasive and invasive, I want to see people walk, right? If that mm -hmm. requires for them to get a surgery because they need high resolution to be able to detect those individual neuron spikes, like, and they can get it safely. Yeah, I mean, that that is a miracle, right? So Absolutely. Um, that is kind of like my take on, on the pros and cons for uh, between invasive and non-invasive neurotech. 
Understood. Understood. And I think also touching back a little bit, um, I would like to talk about some of these applications as well, regardless of the, the method used. Um, you had also mentioned some of the more kind of uh, futuristic applications that impressed you were the ability, for example, to control even as something as simple as a mouse utilizing just your brain. And I know a gentleman, I believe, also controlled his Tesla. So I would like to get your thoughts on these things and kind of how you see some of those future applications uh, playing out specific, specifically with the crown. Yes, yeah, specifically with the crown. When we needed to prove the, eff the efficacy of our device as an EEG device, we developed uh, a program called Kinesis. Kinesis is basically mind control. And, and the way it works is that since the crown has sensors in every lobe of the brain, we actually have two sensors in the motor cortex uh, right here. This described that that's the part of the brain that controls basically the rest of your body, right? So getting data from the motor cortex allowed us to use machine learning to train people that when they think of, let's say, moving their hand, even if they don't move their hand, but they, that thought, right, and that whole, um, like all those neurons activating is enough, it produces an, enough electrical impulses to be able to, to, to be captured with our software and be detected as an intent, right? So that is what you're looking for. Um, the, the complexity uh, comes in when you want to do multiple degrees of freedom. For example, just scrolling down is just one degree of freedom. If you want to scroll down and up, that's two. So, you know, adding those different degrees of freedom uh, can be extremely challenging, right? Uh, but we started with one degree of freedom. We were able to have the first the first version of the crown, a, you know, uh, detect that motor base intent in real time with almost no lag to like 80% degree. Just like many things in life, there is actually a learning curve and there are people that are naturally you know, more inclined to be better at doing mind control than, than others. Like if you were trying to detect the intent of, let's just say, um, hit a ball with a bat, let's say a baseball player, right? A person imagining doing that swing would definitely produce a very distinct pattern versus the person who has not really been training uh, for swinging that bat, right? So um, you could train all sorts of different motor base movements, like uh, lifting your arm, pinching, you know, like jumping, um, even like doing jumping jacks and like biting a, a lemon. It uh, turns out that like biting a lemon, like, it, it, like if you imagine right now biting a lemon, you, you can almost feel what that sensation would feel like and those neurons sure. would activate and you can train for that. So we had someone actually use that same intent to like fire up a, a, a very unique like workflow of like ordering a pizza. You know, like, okay, when I think about this, this is going to go with my automation in my, you know, Chrome browser. It's going to order a pizza from DoorDash. And you have examples of like count, countless examples of people doing uh, really cool stuff with that Kinesis uh, API that we developed. And what would you say is the craziest application you've seen so far within that program? For Kinesis, the craziest thing, I mean, there's nothing like moving big, big things without mm -hmm. lifting a finger, right? Magneto. So, of course, like um, Arab uh, summoning a Tesla with the crown, you know, that's pretty cool and impressive. I personally done uh, written some code to, con to like launch a drone, like a small drone, and even like flip it. You know, like you, you train for that, like rotation movement. Um, but you know, there are people that have like control, like tiny robots, um, video games on the screen. The other day, uh, Wes, um, posted a video on Twitter of like, he created his own Kinesis software using, uh, GPT algorithms. Uh, yeah. which, you know, uh, definitely came out or were more readily available uh, after, you know, we already had launched our own, which uses a completely different method. So he, he shows how he's able to 
play um, a game that has two degrees of freedom where he can go up and down and skip obstacles. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, the possibilities are endless. I mean, you can do all sorts of things. You, you, you could program it that it lifts your desk, you know, or brings it down. But to me, the most impressive uh, projects are the ones that interact with the physical world because that's when yeah. you get thought to go into the digital realm back into the physical world and have an effect. I think there's nothing more profound than that. Yeah, I'm just wrapping my head around this. It's absolutely wild to think about. And uh, it raises some some new interesting questions. Okay, so obviously the collaboration with Grimes as an artist was prolific. And um, I've always been a fan of her work. That being said, how do you see neurotechnology intersecting with contemporary art and fashion specifically? With art and fashion. Mm -hmm. um, the... About a week or two ago, artist uh, Pretty Light um, was wearing uh, a crown on stage and they were showing their level of focus and relaxation in real time, live to like, I don't know how many hundreds, if not thousands of people. Yeah. And when you give a peek about something very personal about you, about your mental state, and you share it with a, a lot of people. I mean, I think that's something very, very profound because someone could be, the artist could be performing and not only they're giving you their art right there, they're also showing you how their brain is reacting at the act of giving you their art. So I think that's something incredible i think this is something that is definitely going to become huge in the future right i i, I mean artists the good ones they to a degree just get naked in front of their audience to show what they're about mm -hmm. there's nothing more intimate than the brain right yeah so that is something that is it is fascinating to me when it comes to fashion, there are many applications that I can think of, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if we just take the very obvious example of like how something looks on you, right? Couldn't a brain-computer interface be communicating with a piece of clothing or textile or even like electronic ink to change based on, on something very, you know, deep and primal about you, uh, that is definitely something that, you know, can be done today uh, with a few lines of code. So um, definitely can see the fashion world being um, like very into changing things in real time. So in a way, it's not that the, when the work is finished, it's done, is that the work just changes depending on a set of circumstances and feelings. If we detect that you're in a down mood, shouldn't your body reflect that, you know? Um, so I think we're going from like a hard-coded world where you're, you know, wearing the music that you're listening to, to uh, mm -hmm. like a new adaptive world where all those things can be different any given second because of someone's brain. Unbelievable. Yeah, put into context, that's extremely fascinating. A neuroadaptive world. Okay. So looking at the roadmap then of neurosity, because we're touching on the future, what do you think the next five to 10 years of brain-computer interface technology will bring us? And how will neurosity contribute to that vision? For neurosity, um... Well, the first thing that is very important to understand is that even though this EEG technology has been around for a hundred years next year, um, we only have seen the tip of the iceberg. And the reason is because devices that are able to capture that data won't really be able to be used uh, with real world applications unless they, are, they make the same jump that the phone did when they turn us to a smartphone. They have an operating system. They can be updated over the air in real time. 
uh, they have internet connectivity, they have cellular network, they have both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, all of those things. The, the crown is, is about the only device that does that. Maybe there's another one out there that probably hasn't picked a lot of notoriety, but um, that being said, the important part is that you can order a device, you can put it on, you open an app, and you can do something as simple as pressing a button and say, I want to feel more upbeat, right? Mm. I want to I, I wanna focus, I want to be productive. I want to work on my mindfulness. I want to be able to just like manage my anxiety. Like things that are impeding people from like becoming the best version of themselves because of mental conditions of, of, of cognitive disorders, right? Like, you know, sure. we are already tackling part of that today. So when you ask about the next five years, uh, I think we're going to see that to a, another level where is going to use neurotechnology is going to be essential for people to manage their mental state and their mm -hmm. mental health because like pre pandemic, like one in five people were suffering from like anxiety, you know, and stress and, you know, mm -hmm. post pandemic, those numbers have gotten worse and they, and those numbers are underreported, right? Like not everyone wants to talk about how they feel. Uh, in a world that, that, you know, has a lot of stigma around it. So when it comes specifically to mental health, I think that's going to be, I think that's a killer app. I, I think that that's how people get, you know, healthier brains and like open up themselves to be able to be more productive and be creative and, and just, just feel better. Um, so that's something that is definitely, you know, happening today. Okay. And kind of looking at it from the perspective of both of both product and technology, do you see Neurosity pivoting beyond EEG in the future? Are there any emerging technologies that you could see yourself implementing? There's definitely a number of new brain imaging methods that we're very curious about. Mm -hmm. We are, for us, it's not that important how we image the brain. For us, mm -hmm. it's very important that we can image the brain with accuracy. And to a, to a point that we can scale it and offer it to like a lot of people. Uh, EEG has been, you know, the imaging method modality that we have been able to embrace and deploy at scale. So um, we, you know, I, I cannot talk too much about this publicly because we haven't announced it. There is a next generation headset in the works. It's, it's, it's just mind blowing. It's, you know, like it's, it's, it's going to make the crown look a little ancient. Um, but you know, like the, the future is very bright when it comes to, uh, neurotech devices. I mean, neurosity, um, the crown is a third generation, uh, device that we developed. Um, I think we learned a lot, um, and it feel that we like warmed up. So I think we're really ready to get this party started. Okay, I'll, I'll be excited for that announcement whenever it is uh, on the horizon. So I want to talk a little bit more in the abstract uh, sense of the future, um, because I think your opinion on this is pivotal. So looking out even farther into the future, how do you envision brain-computer interfaces evolving over the next few decades? So we kind of spoke to maybe five years away, decades from now, what is kind of your vision for what this looks like. When we're talking about decades, I think that's when things will really get insane in a really good way. Um, mm -hmm. People will recover their ability to see. People will walk if they were not able to walk before. Um, it's going to integrate seamlessly with a lot of things are happening. Like, I don't know if you're aware, like there's an actual jetpack that someone could put on and with training, like just fly. Right. Um, I think we're going to see neurotechnology, you know, um, making an impact in, of course, more mental health, more, uh, ability, like motor abilities. Um, we are limited by our bodies, right? And if you take the perfectly healthy human being, you know, we have two arms, you know, two hands or legs, we're going to get many more degrees of freedom. So, you know, that concept of like multitasking uh, is, 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 is going to go to a place where 
it's going to extend our abilities to a degree that we'll be able to do so much more. And, you know, like if you start thinking about all the other technologies that are like happening, like self-driving cars and all that, there is a space for a transition where, let's say, if a truck driver uh, that doesn't have a self, you know, uh, driven truck falls asleep at the wheel with a device, you know, uh, detecting fatigue can definitely alert that person or like start like even getting the truck to the side, you know, autonomously. Um, the future of surgery and, and doctors and, and the ability to diagnose, like the brain is, is, is the only organ in the body that it, it does, like psychologists are not observing the actual brain before they diagnose you with medication. Like think about that. Why is that? And you know, like, so there obviously needs to, to be visibility into the brain. Um, EEG has been used at Reading Hospital for decades to, you know, see like the effects of a concussion or, or epilepsy seizures, you know? Um, so there's already even new research of like, that you can use this technology to even like, um, um, see where in the spectrum you are, right? Mm, um, yeah. Or to predict an epilepsy seizure one hour before it happens. Like that research was done and proven is not making it out into the world just yet. There is a huge cycle of like science, product, innovation, and we are about to start seeing all of that as the Neurosity, let's say, app marketplace evolves and there are more applications and there are third-party developers that instead of developing... And an app for the phone, you know, which we have amazing apps for the phone are going to be uh, developing apps for the newer store where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some kid in some basement is going to figure out how to use neurotechnology to a degree that I never thought of or that anyone or these companies, you know, that have been using this, tech, developing this technology for years have even thought of just like it happens with the phones and how you can use a camera to do this and, and, and how Uber figured out, you know, how to bring drivers and, and, and people for ride share together, you know? So like, it, like a lot of the innovation is going to happen just right in front of your eyes, just like it did when the iPhone came out and the app store was launched. And I am very excited for that. And I'll definitely be there, uh, developing, you know, um, more technology so people can, can, can like change the world. So do you envision uh, an app store, for example, for the crown, whereby you could effectively have all these various applications? So for me, perhaps an example would be, and a point you just made, I place the device on my head. And as you said, I could even potentially uh, find out where on the spectrum I am, for example, because it's it could achieve such accurate data that's not accessible right now to you know general psychology. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're building it. Um, we already have third party developers that are making money, creating applications for the crown and offering mm -hmm. therapies for like anxiety and things like that. Like it's already happening, you know? Um, and there are a lot of developers out there that are brilliant that once they get a hold and access to this hardware and the SDK, like, like, the possibilities are just endless, you know. That's unbelievable. So I suppose if if someone were just to generally ask you on the street, they would say, you know, looking at this technology, you know, what are the possibilities for daily interactions and experiences, things that don't require much effort? So for example, just as you wake up in the morning, you put your phone in your pocket, you get your wallet, you get your crown or the next generation thereof. What might that look like if you can just kind of walk me through maybe, a, let's say, a 24-hour day, what that might look like in terms of using the crown or its next generation application? Yeah. So let's say you wake up, um, you put the Neurosity device. It, it's almost invisible, even unnoticeable. 
you know, and, and, we're, and we're talking years or decades from now. It could be it could be anything that you envision. I'm just very curious when there's a time when this is proliferated through society, what it could look like. Okay, so if it's proliferated through society, you wake up. Um, you already know how you slept with a degree of accuracy of like imagine the world before the thermostatic system. Yeah, and people communicated the sensation of a temperature and, and temperature was in a concept, right? Right. We don't have that for the brain. We're starting to get that for the brain and we're going to have that to a point where you're going to know exactly the minutes of high quality sleep you had during that night. Right. Yeah. Um, obviously this device is going to work seamlessly with technologies like chat GPT. And then the communication of it might actually, uh, be, um, uh, uh, soundless, like it, it might write back to the brain, the in information. So the speed in which you can get things done and like, maybe what you need to know about everything about the rest of your day, your schedule, your calendar, where you have to go, you know, do you need to get like, uh, buy a plane ticket or whatnot? Like all of that could happen in minutes, you know, uh, without you having to move, right? Like if you had a co-pilot in your life like that has access to the whole internet mm -hmm. and you could interact with it at a very quick speed what couldn't you do i mean if that's not a superpower then like i don't know what it is so um i won't give you the 24 hours i think i'll let your mind go wild but you like you can see how this is going to interact with your car you know with your kitchen um you'll know even like how like you would probably be able uh to start like downloading information and and skills you know into your brain assuming you have a extremely high bandwidth resolution device um kind of like the matrix i know that sounds crazy i i know it sounds crazy but like you can write to neurons right uh, right now, the only way is with non -in uh, with invasive tech. Could non invasive tech in the future be able to uh, write to specific neurons? We don't know, you know. Uh, mm. But I wouldn't discard that as a possibility. So there, I mean, we've seen how science fiction has shaped the way uh, technology happens. Like, I'll, like it is a cycle where. Um, people get creative, people write down ideas, the movies are made about it. And then that inspire other people who get creative and actually build things to make those things happen. Right. There are things like if you told someone a hundred years ago, this is just 100 years ago. If you tell someone a hundred years ago, you will be able to see and hear your loved one right in front of you that is in another continent, right? And they will allow you to give you a way for you to buy food, you know, from there. Like, you will be like, what is this magic? Like, what is this? This is impossible. So we've mm -hmm. been saying things about the brain that are impossible. You know, what what is going to happen in the next 100 years? Absolutely. This is a superhuman device, just as you said it's going to effectively evolve your ability to perform all sorts of tasks. It's very fascinating. So of course, people are using artificial intelligence for the first time right now. Chat GPT is something you just mentioned, and there will be various competitors releasing soon. Are you working on any active integrations with Chat GPT? And what is kind of the future for Neurosity's integration with AI? So the thing about when you put your platform out there and you consume your own platform and everyone has access to the same platform that you have mm -hmm. is that you're competing against everyone right so yeah uh like a few months ago uh this person in youtube created a video on how to integrate the crown and the sdk which had gpt and the yeah. vi video went viral like over a million views in the first like you know 10 days or so um and 
it's not really up to us to do everything, right? You already see mm -hmm. people getting even ahead of us when it comes to that because the hardware is there, the SDK is there. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the 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 big question is like, how can you turn that into a product that is extremely intuitive to use that everyone can use and including your grandma with very you know little friction, you know? Um, we are we have been using machine learning uh, for many years now, but the way we're using AI, it is very different. Like we're not even using a large language model, right? Like what mm -hmm. we're doing is using uh, something called reinforcement learning, which is basically an algorithm that you start rewarding or penalizing based on on a goal, right? For example, the Neurosity app, like today in production, you go and say, I want to shift into focus, right? Then we get a reinforcement learning agent that has access to how your focus is performing and it has access to modify the music in real time. And you say, okay, I'm gonna change this of the music. I'm gonna mix it and I'm gonna add this and I'm gonna wait milliseconds or seconds to see how your brain reacts to it. Oh it didn't work quite as well. Let me try it again. Just like humans learn, right? Just how you learn to ride a bike. And this algorithm continues to do that until it just understands exactly what your brain needs in that millisecond. And that's what we're calling your adaptive audio, right? So that is how we are non-invasively stimulating the brain without drilling into your skull in a way that humans have been using since day one, which is like sounds and music and, and talking and using, you know, um, audio. So um, that is what, one of the ways we're doing it today. And it's, it's working really great. Like people are loving it. Fantastic. Well, you touched on something interesting a second ago too, when we spoke to writing neurons. And that piqued my interest because I, I want, before we wrap up, I want to <laughs> talk about an abstract concept. You see in science fiction, when people are uploading their consciousness, what they're effectively doing in some scenarios is they're placing a non-invasive uh, product similar to the crown on their head and then uploading their consciousness or downloading information, totally non-invasive. So that's a, a science fiction example, but I'm curious as to your thoughts of what the potential is for a future iteration of the crown to allow people to transcend human consciousness or kind of upload or download capabilities or upload their consciousness. Define consciousness. That's a good question. Tell me, tell me your thoughts and then we'll get into it. You know, I mean, that technology that you described as cool as it sounds, it, you know, it doesn't exist today. Uh, it's not even clear exactly like there are, there are even some theories like that it won't be possible for the brain to fully understand itself. Mm -hmm. If you start thinking about like, you're trying to understand the most complex thing in the world, a, a brain has 80, over 86 billion neurons and you're, you're trying to use the same thing you're trying to understand. Like it is a very hard problem, right? So of course. when you're talking about things like the consciousness with, I would just simply call it right now for the sake of this conversation, like the whole thing, like what the brain is a, uh, capable of storing and evolving, right? It's very different from like changing a tiny thing of it, which is like a high level mental state of just like how relaxed do you feel, right? So when mm -hmm. we're talking about the whole machine, right? We're talking about it and I'm, and I'm calling it a machine, the, the brain, you know, uh, but Sure. You know, it runs on 20 watts of power. 20% um, of everything you consume uh, when it comes to energy goes to it. That is a very hard question for me, you know? So um, I'm not going to even try to, to, um, to see how that would even be possible. But, you know, the way we get there, um, like... Anything in, in software, you break a very hard problem into smaller problems is that we need to understand every single aspect and focus is one, relaxation is one, uh, sleep is one. 
detecting trends in depression, which doesn't happen overnight, right? And anxiety and PTSD and alcoholism and Alzheimer's, you know, like you start solving every single one of those problems. Every single one of those problems can take many years, if not decades. So um, I would just say, I would just slice that cake into a very thin, very small problem, focus on that. That's what neurosis is doing today. And we just might at some point get to, um, a point where it's like, okay, we, we kind of know 10% of what this thing is, you know, but uh, the full thing, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a lot. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. That's articulated incredibly well. So that brings me to my final question, Alex, what's next for neurosity? What's next for neurosity? Well, we have uh, our third generation device in the market. Next year, we're gonna have, we're gonna release our fourth generation device from scratch, very different, more powerful. Um, our software um, has been perfectly tuned to help you with your basic mental health needs. Um, we're going to be helping people. We're going to, we're, we're going to help people have healthier brains. I mean, that's, that's the immediate thing that we're doing right now. Um, that's how we can help that mom that doesn't have enough energy to take their kid to play with their friends because something in her brain is not quite right. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that was me. Right. So yeah. we're going to allow that person with epilepsy to not do that activity that has high risk during seizures because there's already a seizure detected before it happens. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to help people just sleep better so they can uh, be really present in front of their loved ones and, and their friends, you know. It's, it's a very human world right like that's what we want to to do it's like we're not trying to make you more famous richer we're trying to get you to be have an extremely awesome human life as a human that you are you know uh just just with another tool that allows you to just feel better and be better for other people well, I love it. Well, I'm excited to see what you and the team have next. And thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with me today. It was really insightful. I appreciate you, Alex. Thank you. Akiva, I appreciate you too. And thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you, man.